speech. So uh, hello everyone, welcome to today's data learning talk. So today we're very happy to have Francisco uh, Miniaco from the um, Institute of Theoretical Paris and uh, CEA at Paris Eclay. And she will give us a talk about statistical physics of stochastic gradient descent. So uh, Francisca, I will leave the audience with you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the data learning seminar for inviting me. I'm very happy um, to be here today uh, talking to you about some statistical physics methods that can be applied to study learning problems, and in particular on my work on uh, stochastic gradient descent. So um, first of all, um, just let me say a few words about the interaction between the fields of physics and machine learning. Uh, it dates back uh, uh, like 20 years ago, even more, uh, even, even 40, but, um, but it, it, it has been recently developed a lot. And uh, machine learning has been uh, very useful in a variety of uh, physical applications. So state-of-the-art machine learning techniques have been used uh, in uh, different uh, applications ranging from particle physics uh, um, to cosmology. Uh, but this is not uh, uh, the focus of today's talk. It's an interesting uh, field that, uh, for instance, is reviewed in uh, this uh, um, in this paper um, from uh, Reviews of Modern Physics. Uh, today, I will consider instead the other side of the arrow. That's uh, what statistical physics can say about the key principles underlying learning in artificial systems. And uh, this is also reviewed in uh, this um, article, in particular, considering statistical physics methods. And this is what uh, uh, my group uh, studies. And I will just uh, like to highlight some of the key ingredients of uh, uh, this approach uh, that are uh, the fact that the data are drawn uh, from a known generative model. So at variance with the, uh, what is usually done in computer science, um, we do not consider the worst case uh, scenario, but we instead fix uh, um, some data structure and we consider the typical case scenario with that particular data. And uh, we consider prototype models that are uh, simple enough to be amenable to an exact analytic descriptions, but uh, rich enough to still capture the phenomenology that we want to study. And uh, so uh, in particular, as uh, um, Lenka has explained in this comment on natural physics, uh, understanding the principles of deep learning requires uh, uh, studying the building blocks of uh, learning algorithms that are identified in these three ingredients. The structure in the data, in the training data, the architecture of the model, and the optimization algorithm that is used for training. And uh, like a full understanding of how deep learning works require uh, understanding the interplay of these three uh, building blocks, which in turn requires understanding uh, each single component. So my group is working in this direction. And I think that uh, Bruno Loureiro gave a talk a uh, um, couple of weeks ago uh, concerning, I think, uh, uh, in particular, the data structure in the models. And today I will uh, focus instead on what we can say on the optimization algorithms that are used using statistical physics methods. I will consider a particular setting that is the one of supervised learning, where um, the network is presented with a set of training examples uh, denoted by X that are vectors in dimension N, and there are uh, M such vectors. Uh, and I will consider uh, scalar labels uh, which can encompass both uh, binary classification or uh, regression problems. The goal is to achieve a good performance on the, the test set. Um, so on a new sample that has not been used for training. And the new label, uh, Y new, is estimated via a neural network, uh, which is parameterized by some vectors uh, W. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, the vector, as in also in practice, is uh, 
trained via uh, empirical risk minimization. So it's obtained as the minimizer of a loss, uh, which is obtained as the sum over um, small, these small L functions that are per sample losses that evaluate the performance of the network on uh, each sample. Uh, however, um, computing the performance of the network on all the training data set at each step of the training is computationally expensive. And uh, what is done in practice is that uh, um, the weights of the network are updated in the direction uh, of, the, of the gradients of the loss, but just on a subset of training examples. So at each time, a so-called mini batch of training samples is uh, drawn at uh, random with some uh, particular protocols that I will uh, explain later. And uh, the network is updated according to the performance only on this subset. And uh, this will be the setting. And of course, uh, uh, do not hesitate to interrupt me and ans ask questions at any point of the talk if uh, something is uh, not clear. Um, then um, this simple optimization procedure actually achieves uh, extraordinary results uh, in applications leading to um, good generalization uh, properties. And uh, this is a topic that is not uh, understood yet. And in particular, uh, what is crucial to understand is the interplay between the landscape, which is, the, which is given by the loss, uh, and the and the noise introduced by this uh, uh, mini batch sampling procedure, which seems to be crucial to achieve a good performance. So a stochastic in the scent navigates this very high dimensional loss landscape. And although uh, it has been shown that uh, there exist uh, regions of even global minima that are bad in the sense that uh, they lead to bad generalization properties, uh, SGD can avoid them somehow. And, um, and instead, when the, algorit the algorithm is initialized at random, it can achieve uh, uh, regions uh, with the minima that have uh, good generalization properties. So how this gradient-based algorithm do that is not completely clear and has, uh, is an open question, uh, which is uh, attracting a lot of interest. So this can be recast in, um, in this uh, reformulation. So which regions of the lost landscape are attractive for the algorithm? And uh, something else that is not completely understood is in which cases this uh, stochasticity, so this uh, mini batch uh, sampling procedure is really crucial for the performance. So in other words, when is SGD really better than gradient descent? which uh, would correspond to the case uh, where all the training examples are used at all time steps and, uh, and why. And uh, instead in which other cases uh, it's not and SGD is uh, only faster than gradient descent but not better in terms of the performance. And in order to understand this, it's important to characterize uh, the effective noise that is introduced uh, by the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So uh, first, let me just uh, um, uh, uh, introduce some of the previous uh, works that is related to this. Uh, indeed, uh, um, it, is, um, it is important for the reasons that I've mentioned uh, to understand the full uh, algorithmic trajectory across, uh, um, across learning, because it really uh, can affect dramatically uh, the final results. But modeling the dynamics of SGD is very complicated because uh, the loss is in very high dimension, so the dynamics, and uh, um, this noise uh, drives the dynamics out of equilibrium. So it's complicated to characterize it at long times. And uh, the trajectory has been uh, studied in different settings. First of all, uh, resorting to some approximations. So for instance, in these works, uh, the noise of SGD uh, is modeled as a, a sort of Langevin-like approximation uh, of the gradient descent algorithm. So basically the SGD algorithm is written as gradient descent plus some noise that's the difference between the stochastic and the full gradient. 
And, um, and then invoking the central limit theorem, this uh, uh, dynamics is studied as a uh, uh, Langevin uh, dynamics with Gaussian noise. And some interesting results uh, uh, are derived. However, this approach has the drawback um, that the, actually it requires uh, an ill-defined continuous time limit because the dynamics is studied in the flow limit with the learning rate uh, or a time step dt that goes to zero. But at the same time, to keep the sto stochasticity, um, this uh, learning rate has to be uh, finite, uh, kept finite as a finite parameter in the variance of the noise. So it's not really well defined, this limit. And, uh, and moreover, the validity of the central limit theorem in this setting in general has been questioned. And there are um, other results, um, for instance, experimental results that show that instead, uh, stochastic gradient descent with the sufficiently low batch and the high learning rate um, can actually um, um, have a fat tailed noise uh, so perform levy flights uh, in the loss landscape. So this work, uh, this, this is an active uh, research direction modeling uh, the dynamics of SGD and approximation of gradient descent and then trying to model uh, this, uh, this approximated noise. But this is not what I will consider. Uh, another line of research uh, instead is focusing on tracking the whole trajectory of the dynamics uh, without resorting to these approximations. But then uh, this can be done only in some special cases. The first of these cases uh, is uh, uh, linear networks, starting with some uh, uh, work uh, dating back uh, uh, in the 90s. And, uh, and then there are some very recent uh, um, interesting uh, um, developments uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, deep uh, linear networks. Uh, sorry, can you, can you hear me? Because in full screen, I cannot really see. Yes, we can yes. hear you okay. clearly. Yeah. And, um, and then another setting where these dynamics can be uh, tracked. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't see the chart. Uh, are there, uh, yes, okay, thanks. And um, another case where these dynamics uh, uh, can be tracked analytically is the case of uh, online uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, for uh, uh, two layer neural networks. And this can be done um, in the case of a finite uh, hidden layer, hidden layer of finite size or um, infinitely wide uh, uh, hidden layer. Um, however, um, linear networks lack the expressivity of nonlinear uh, ones. And uh, online SGD, and moreover, this analysis is done for great full batch gradient descent. Uh, and the online SGD, um, that is the setting where the network uh, does not reuse uh, the same samples twice. So basically, at each time, it's presented with a new sample. Uh, in this setting, uh, uh, there is no distinction between test and train loss because the dynamics is on the population loss. And so there is no notion of landscape. And if one wants to study uh, the properties of the landscape uh, and the interplay between landscape and noise, uh, this setting uh, um, cannot be used. Uh, so what we wanted to do instead is to consider uh, multi-pass stochastic gradient descent where the mini batch of examples uh, come from a fixed pool of examples, a fixed training set. And so the same examples are reused uh, multiple times. There is uh, much less theory on this. And uh, we were able to um, derive an analytic characterization of this algorithm um, using dynamical mean field theory uh, from statistical physics. And uh, uh, we did this in the, this also, uh, this is exact in the limit of uh, uh, high dimension or the so-called thermodynamic limit in physics, which means that both the number of samples and the number of dimensions tend to infinity at a fixed ratio, uh, the sample complexity alpha, that is the number of samples divided the number of dimensions. And we did this for a um, shallow neural network, uh, but then I will discuss maybe five times there, there are uh, possible extensions of, uh, of this. 
so let me just uh, um, say a few words uh, about the sampling protocol because it's, uh, this is uh, crucial. Uh, it turns out to be crucial for the performance. So we consider two types of sampling. One is uh, close to vanilla SGD to what is done in practice. It's a simply sample with replacement. So um, basically at each time, uh, uh, a fraction B of the examples is, uh, is considered for training. And then uh, uh, at the next time they are uh, redrawn uh, in IID way. And crucially here, we consider extensive batch sizes. So this B will be the fraction of samples used for training. And uh, we stay between zero and one. Then we also consider a different uh, um, sampling protocol that we introduced, uh, the persistent SGD which uh, uh, basically um, considers uh, for each uh, uh, sample a two-state Markov process. So basically, at each time, each sample can be in or out of the, of the gradients used for training and uh, um, with some rates. And the typical time that uh, uh, stays out uh, of this, um, of this uh, training uh, batch is called the persistence time when we fix it. And then we fix the fraction of the, again, of the mini, of, uh, the mini batch uh, samples, again, to B. So basically, uh, in this case, uh, each example is endowed with some uh, persistence. And, uh, and this uh, will turn out to be beneficial in some uh, complex uh, learning problems uh, with rough landscapes. But uh, actually the first reason for uh, why we did this is that in this case, uh, the continuous time limit of stochastic gradient descent is well-defined due to the persistence. And then for very small persistence time of the order of the learning rate, one can recover the vanilla SGD limit where basically the, the samples are reshuffled and they have no persistence. So with this, uh, let me just talk uh, briefly about uh, uh, the lost landscapes because the noise and the landscape will be the focus of the talk. I consider first uh, a category of landscape that I call simple. And this is what I mean by simple landscape. If I consider uh, the sample complexity, so again, the ratio between uh, the training examples and the dimensions. When I have very few examples, so below a certain, uh, a certain threshold value alpha star, I can uh, fit all the examples and I can achieve zero training loss. And in these simple models, it will correspond to a wide lake of solutions that are all connected. And then, uh, right above this alpha star, uh, the loss will become convex and there will be just one global minimum. So basically this is simple because gradient descent can always find uh, the global minimum. And, uh, and uh, as, as soon as the number of examples is larger than alpha star, this global minimum can be found. So there are many examples of such landscapes. Uh, uh, I will consider uh, for simplicity, uh, just uh, one example that is a binary um, Gaussian mixture classification where the data come from two different uh, uh, clouds of points that are Gaussian clouds. One is labeled by minus one. The other is labeled by plus one. And the goal is to separate them with the right uh, hyperplane. This model has been studied uh, um, in statistics uh, and in statistical physics. Uh, this, uh, uh, this threshold uh, um, alpha star of this transition between the perfect separability of the data and the impossibility to separate the data has been derived in many different settings, both uh, uh, with non-rigorous statistical methods, uh, statistical physics methods, and uh, with the rigorous uh, uh, techniques. Uh, indeed, uh, as I said, uh, um, 
given the convexity of the setting uh, above this threshold, one can exactly derive the infinite time limit where the dynamics of gradient descent, full batch gradient descent will go. And uh, as I said, the, this can be done by heuristic methods fr uh, from replica theory or with the rigorous proof uh, via the Gordon Minimax approach from statistics. And both these methods uh, in the infinite dimensional limit allow to derive exact analytic expressions that uh, are scalar and that uh, enc fully encode the performance uh, of the network. So there is an um, important dimensionality reduction. You, you don't need to understand these uh, equations. I just uh, wanted to show that these are uh, just a few uh, equations that uh, can be iterated. The solution can be found in a self-consistent way. And then you will end up with an expression for the uh, generalization error and the training loss. And, uh, and the, the equations derived from replica theory and Gordon Minimax are exactly the same. And uh, for instance, uh, we, we did this for a model where there were uh, different parameters. Um, the two clouds could have different sizes. The noise of the cloud could be tuned. And we were able to derive a sharp uh, value for the um, phase transition. So for this alpha star, which depends uh, on uh, all uh, the parameters, so uh, which uh, will be lower and lower for higher noise uh, delta, because uh, if these clusters are more noise, uh, it's, uh, it's more uh, difficult uh, to separate them. So the, the number of samples above which I cannot separate them will be lower. And, um, and this transition will also depend on the relative size rho of the clusters, because uh, if the clusters are very unbalanced, it's easier to separate them. And this is just to give you an example of results that can be obtained rigorously uh, for long time dynamics, uh, for the late time dynamics, for gradient descent. But as soon as I consider either a slightly more complicated uh, landscape or uh, just uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, it's not uh, easy to arrive at such uh, characterizations because uh, uh, the dynamics becomes much more complicated and uh, there, are not, uh, way, there are not so many ways to, to characterize it. So if we want to consider um, multi-pass stochastic gradient descent, um, even in this simple setting, um, we have to resort uh, to more complicated and, um, well, not more complicated, but still uh, um, heuristic techniques and, um, and we can say much less, uh, but we can say something. And we did this uh, uh, using dynamical mean field theory uh, from uh, statistical physics and that I will not have time to um, detail. Uh, but um, it has been introduced in all the references uh, uh, below. And uh, in particular, uh, has been uh, uh, derived for a closed model, uh, the random perceptron, uh, in uh, this paper of 2018 from Agoritzis and Al. Uh, but the, in, uh, the, in the, the case, uh, um, the setting was uh, um, random, so basically, the, there were no um, there were no correlation between the data and the labels, uh, and so there was no notion of generalization error, and uh, uh, it was for um, gradient descent or Langevin dynamics, which goes to equilibrium. Uh, so basically, um, it was a, um, a disordered system uh, model, uh, but uh, but not really a neural network uh, model for what we want to study. So we had to introduce uh, uh, this uh, uh, structure between uh, the data and the labels. For instance, the uh, problem that I have uh, explained on Gaussian mixture classification. And uh, we had to include uh, this uh, sampling uh, procedure in the dynamics, uh, considering multipass stochastic gradient descent. What uh, dynamical mean field theory allows to do 
is that uh, it performs a dimensional reduction from uh, the starting dynamics, which is the dynamics of the, of the weights, uh, where we have uh, a large number of degrees of freedom that are strongly correlated between them. And then we end up with just uh, one effective stochastic process and one ODE that uh, um, that encode the evolution of the, some scalar quantities that uh, are all we need to, um, to compute the loss and the errors as a function of time uh, at the price of adding memory to the dynamics. So we go from a Markovian system high, of high dimensional, strongly coupled degree of freedom to a non-Markovian dynamics of just one effective degree of freedom. And, um, and here I am just uh, putting uh, under the carpet some of the details because it's actually a bit more complicated than this. These two equations, uh, this SDE and uh, ODE, depend on a set of uh, auxiliary functions and kernels that are in turn, in turn um, averages obtained as averages over the stochastic process. So um, this, uh, um, this complicates the solution of these equations uh, that can only be done uh, self-consistently uh, numerically. So we arrive at uh, this system uh, where, the, where we have a low dimensional characterization of the performance. And at the very end, we have to integrate these equations to obtain the learning curves. And, um, and now let me show some results for this first part. Mm, for both a stochastic gradient descent, the vanilla one, and the persistent gradient descent on the right. Um, this is just to show that uh, even um, if we are comparing a, a infinite dimensional limit with the simulations uh, at dimension uh, uh, of order of few hundreds, uh, we obtain um, a very good matching between the theory and experiments. Uh, and, um, and so we can really track the dynamics uh, of the generalization uh, and uh, the training errors. Uh, so for instance, here I'm plotting the generalization error as a function of time. However, given the simplicity of the, of the task, uh, here different uh, stochastic algorithms do not uh, um, lead to dramatically different uh, results uh, in terms of performance because the task is quite uh, trivial. So um, we cannot, to study the performance of different algorithms, we have to resort uh, to more complicated uh, um, landscapes. But uh, first, let me tell you an application where having a simple landscape, uh, it's actually very useful. Uh, and this to, uh, just to characterize the effective noise uh, of stochastic gradient descent. Indeed, uh, um, when we have a simple landscape and a simple data structure, uh, we are basically disentangling the stochasticity of the algorithm uh, from all the other possible sources of stochasticity because the landscape is convex, it's not rough, and, uh, and, and so the algorithm, this, the mini batch sampling procedure is the only source of stochasticity in the problem. So we wanted to characterize this effective noise and we have found out that, uh, uh, well, we can do it uh, with um, uh, linear response theory uh, and uh, effective uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem. So basically from the DMFT, we can not only access uh, one time uh, uh, functions, but also two time functions. And in particular, the correlation function uh, between the weights uh, at two different times and the response function of the weights to a small uh, infinitesimal perturbation. And these two quantities are important because at equilibrium, they are related by um, a fluctuation dissipation relation, uh, which gives us uh, the temperature of the system. And, uh, and in particular, uh, we, can, um, we can really access the temperature uh, by if we integrate on both sides, 
we can have the the sky bar, which is some rescaling of the integrated response and the rescaling of the correlation. We can plot them and extract the, the temperature. This holds at equilibrium, but it has been uh, shown in, uh, for instance, uh, in the theory of glasses that actually defining an effective temperature uh, is useful to understand the dynamics uh, at long times, even if it's out of equilibrium. And indeed, uh, we did that. So we integrated the, the DMFT equations and we plotted the integrated response versus the correlation. And uh, we have found that this relation is linear, meaning that there is a, a well-defined temperature, effective temperature for stochastic gradient descent. So we could estimate this temperature directly by the MFT. So let's look at the left uh, um, plot for stochastic gradient descent. And we could, uh, we could uh, extract the effective temperature, which is simply the um, inverse of the slope of this line. And uh, we could measure it uh, as a function of the problem parameters, seeing that, for instance, it is uh, uh, linear with the learning rate at small learning rates. And, um, and also for persistent SGD, we have explored the dependence of the effective temperature on the parameters. And uh, here it's a bit more complicated because uh, the, the persistence is still there. So for uh, times that are of the, or for time differences that are of the order of uh, the persistence time, there is still some correlation. So in the stationary state, if I look at two configurations that are um, closer than the, the average persistence time mm, times the batch size, then they will be more correlated and this effective temperature will be lower. And then if I wait enough in the stationary state, I will, be that, I will see that this relation becomes linear. So again, also for persistent SGD at late times and large time difference, I can extract a linear um, relation and the, there is a well-defined constant effective temperature. And we have seen that this is uh, increasing with the persistence time. And to our surprise, it's not non-monotonic with the batch size. This temperature is really a way to quantify the effective noise uh, of the algorithm. It gives us a measure of the magnitude of the algorithm in the regime where, uh, where all this, the samples cannot be uh, linearly separated. So this is for sample complexity larger than this alpha star. And um, then we can turn to uh, more complex landscapes, uh, but uh, we know from Solstoy that uh, uh, each complex landscape is complex in its own way. So I will directly consider uh, an example of complex landscape that is uh, the sign uh, retrieval problem. So uh, what I mean by complex landscape is the following. Uh, for sign retrieval, uh, where basically the task is to, um, is a regression task where uh, there is a, a, a hidden signal, uh, W star, uh, that is not directly observed. Uh, what we observe is the absolute value of the projection of the signal on some measurements uh, that are Gaussian. And we want to uh, recover the, the sign of these, uh, of these measurements while we observe the absolute value. It may look simple, but it's actually a very hard uh, problem algorithmically uh, because uh, below, uh, below um, Sample complexity one, uh, the solution can be fine because we can invert the relations. But then above one, the landscape become very rough with a proliferation of local minima uh, and just uh, one good uh, global minimum. Uh, and so it's very uh, hard to explore uh, this landscape and different algorithms uh, perform in a different way. So this is uh, the so-called hard phase uh, that at variance with simple landscape, uh, it's not, uh, there is not just a, a transition from uh, an easy phase uh, to a phase where, uh, where there is just one minimum, but there is a whole hard phase in between where in principle there is one global minimum, but our algorithm cannot find it. And this is algorithm dependent. 
So it has been studied for different algorithms uh, that are um, uh, that are in this case, for instance, this LLL algorithm uh, can really uh, do this exactly at alpha equal one. Uh, but uh, uh, this is not uh, a time that it's linear, uh, an algorithm that is linear in uh, uh, with time linear in the sample complexity. And, uh, um, and then, um, sorry, in the size. And then uh, approximate message passing, uh, which is another algorithm, uh, can do this at a slightly higher alpha in linear time. Uh, but here we are interested uh, in uh, uh, the performance of gradient-based algorithm, which are which have broader applications and are not specific to this uh, to this problem. And in this case, much less is known. Uh, we know that uh, with an infinite uh, hidden layer, uh, this problem can be solved at sample complexity too. And uh, with some uh, regularization and uh, smart initialization techniques, it can be again solved in linear sample complexity. Uh, but uh, what about uh, uh, plain gradient descent, where the training is done uh, on the mean squared uh, loss. So basically uh, the, diff the, the square difference between the, the squared of these uh, of these labels that we observe, um, just to remove the absolute value, but, uh, but still without any regularization and the smart initialization. Well, this is not, um, this is not uh, known uh, in a linear sample complexity. There are no rigorous results uh, proving that this can be done uh, in linear sample complexity to the best of my knowledge, but the, um, uh, the results are just for a, a higher sample complexity. And so we wanted to study this. And moreover, we wanted to study the performance of stochastic gradient descent and uh, basically use this uh, very complex uh, landscape as a benchmark task to assess uh, whether SGD is really better than GD, at least in some very hard problem. So we, we could derive the same uh, analytic characterization via dynamical mean field theory, because uh, it is not limited to convex settings and the linear um, problems, but still the network is shallow. And, um, and we considered uh, first the dynamics of pure gradient descent, just to understand better what is the landscape that is seen by the algorithm. And here we can see the simulations uh, in uh, gray and the, the theory in red. And what we are plotting on the y-axis is the average um, magnetization, which means the cosine similarity uh, with the signal. Uh, so how well are we recovering the signal? And it says between zero and one. And here we are uh, reproducing the smart initialization that is done in some cases. And, uh, and we see that uh, quite surprisingly, although the algorithm is uh, initialized very close to the signal, so at uh, cosine similarity 0 0.5, it still cannot uh, recover it perfectly. And, um, and this is uh, something that our theory guarantees to hold in the infinite dimension, not only in a finite dimension. And, um, and moreover, we see that uh, um, if we initialize it just uh, um, slightly higher, it can achieve perfect recovery. But if the same, um, if the same uh, um, region close to the signal is reached dynamically, so this is marked by the green uh, line, the algorithm is still trapped. So basically the algorithm can be trapped arbitrarily close to the signal uh, or very close and the landscape uh, is very complicated. But then we studied the uh, stochastic gradient descent and we ran extensive simulations for uh, persistent and stochastic gradient descent versus gradient descent. And we can see that both stochastic and in particular persistent uh, stochastic gradient descent really outperform gradient descent in this task. And um, so basically uh, we have always focused on times that are linear with the system size, because this is the regime uh, that, um, that is basically 
something that we can uh, we can achieve numerically and uh, and so that's why it's uh, it's interesting and uh, and then uh, we have um, we have run both informed and, and random initialization and we've seen that in both cases uh, uh, persistent hgd is better and why is it so well in the um, in the learning dynamics this uh, uh, mini batch sampling protocol induces a sort of automatic uh, self annealing so basically we have already seen this uh, um, although i didn't comment on that uh, on uh, the effective temperature because basically if we compute the effective temperature in the regimes where the network can find the good solution we see that at the end of training regardless of the parameter the effective temperature goes to zero because the algorithm is uh, uh, like uh, automatically performing uh, an annealing uh, until zero. And this can be seen um, by comparing the different algorithms. So when we look at uh, the different realization of the gradient descent um, runs, we see that uh, gradient descent can get trapped in local minima for long times, basically at all eights, even very close to the signal. Introducing stochastic gradient descent with the mini batches uh, um, drawn um, um, with replacement IAD at all uh, times uh, gives a, a small improvement, gives some improvement, uh, but still the algorithm can be trapped. While if one um, introduces some persistency, the algorithm automatically annuls to the signal and uh, does not get stuck. So in this case, persistence seems to be important. And, um, and then we have explored the role of the different hyperparameters. And again, we have seen that um, quite surprisingly, the best performance is obtained at intermediate uh, values of uh, uh, batch size and uh, persistence time. So for extensive intermediate batch size and uh, persistence time that is much higher than the learning rate. And so this is uh, this suggests that at least in some very hard uh, task when the landscape is very rough and there is just one local minimum that by the way is not the regime where neural networks normally lie, but still this provides us as a benchmark task where we can see that stochastic gradient descent uh, beats gradient descent. Then understanding what happens in uh, other landscapes where um, there, is a, there are wide regions of uh, minima uh, that are maybe not even connected. Uh, it's more complicated and is a challenge for the future. So here I'm just giving some perspectives. Uh, so something that we are working on is uh, um, gaining uh, more insights from the, from the theory. So in particular on uh, the optical, optimal hyperparameter Turing and understanding better how the stochastic noise relates to generalization. Then uh, we can extend the, this theory to uh, more uh, complicated data structures and also uh, networks with the one layer of hidden units as soon as this uh, um, layer is finite. And also recently uh, for a different model, um, this uh, dynamical mean field theory has been applied to study uh, learning with the momentum for gradient descent. And this is something interesting because uh, uh, it's actually the most realistic algorithm that one can, uh, can study analytically. It would be SGD and momentum. And, uh, and then, of, of course, these uh, equations are, um, are heuristic. So one, uh, one challenge would be to prove them rigorously as has been done in other cases uh, for, um, for the PSPIN model, for instance. And with this, uh, um, I thank you for uh, your attention and um, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Francesca, for the very nice talk. Um, so for people in, in who attend this meeting, so you can either, um, so for people who have questions, you can either unmute yourself to ask the question or you can type your question in the chat. Um, so in case you don't want your voice to be recorded. So in that case, I will read um, the question out for you. Okay, so I see there's a hand up for um, Holger. So yeah, please, please go ahead. 
Hi, Fran Pascal. Thank you for this super nice uh, overview over what's going on there. And I also, I like this interplay in the two directions between physics and machine learning in both directions. That's super interesting. What I also find impressive is this huge difference in your example of this persistence. So having the persistence leads to perfect results, not having the persistence does not lead the perfect results. What I was wondering is, are there any differences in the persistence time? So is there, what was there in your example, a threshold for the persistence uh, parameter so that if the, the ensemble members stay not long enough, you will not reach this perfect result, but they should stay long enough or is it the other way around? Is there any, any, any difference? Well, uh, you need to, um, your persistence time, uh, and basically, let's say, uh, the persistence time times the batch size to be uh, shorter than your full simulation time. Because before this typical time, you're basically on average fixing your mini batch. So effectively, you are just looking at a subset of samples. It's sort of fr freezing them. Because before this typical time, um, once the ones that are in stay in and the ones that are out stay out. You're not uh, refreshing anything. So you're sort of overfitting a subset of examples for a while. This may be beneficial in the sense that uh, you're learning some structure. And then when you switch it after this uh, typical time, then you, you're great, you, you find yourself with the very high stochastic gradient in, uh, let's say, unexpected direction, directions that, uh, that basically gives you higher noise. And this is why we think that the effective temperature is increasing with the persistence time because of this, uh, let's say, dramatic shock that you have when you change your batch. But you need this uh, typical time. You need your time to be uh, larger than this typical time. Otherwise, you are just overfitting a subset of examples. And you can see it from the right uh, panel of this figure. Uh, if you look at the time, you see basically that higher persistence times are associated with longer plateaus at, uh, at low uh, cosine similarity. So while SGD basically almost immediately um, increases because here the, the first step is basically the order of the learning rate, but then it gets uh, stuck. Increasing the persistence time gives to longer and longer plateaus but then eventually, when your time has exceeded the persistence time, you arrive to the signal. This is very specific to the phase retrieval problem, which again, uh, I do not expect to be a landscape that we commonly find in the neural network applications, where uh, in general, uh, since the network is very overparameterized, we rely in the regime where both training and test data can be, can be learned. So basically, it's um, it, it's not a, the same landscape, but it's a complicated landscape where we can assess the difference between the algorithms. Thank you. That was super super helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, let's see if people have other questions. Uh, meanwhile, I have a question. Uh, so in fact, I think, Francisca, you have already mentioned that uh, in the perspective. But I wonder, uh, in practice, do you have any experiments uh, to see that um, for all these ni nice properties you presented for the SGD, how sensitive are they to the structure of the neural networks? So for example, if we use um, so the multi, uh, multi layer, as you, uh, as you mentioned here, and also, for example, to the CNN or the, or the INN, for example, Yes. Uh, can they still stand these, these properties of, of SGD in terms of complexity and, uh, and accuracy? What, we know, what I know is that, uh, um, well, we, we know for the phase retrieval problem that uh, as soon as we have an infinitely wide hidden layer, uh, gradient descent can uh, reach the good signal at sample complexity too. We also know that uh, persistent SGD without any hidden layer can reach uh, um, perfect uh, recovery at very, very low sample complexity. What about combining the two? Uh, my group has run some experiments on this, and apparently, um, at least for the moment, uh, combining the two doesn't add much. So basically, 
having either one of them is dramatically helpful. Both of them doesn't change. But it's, um, I mean, it's hard. That's why we went to these uh, such hard settings because in neural network settings, um, it's a, uh, the space of parameters is so huge that it's complicated to explore it. And maybe uh, it's harder to analyze it. But the one direction that we are considering is uh, to relate uh, uh, the noise of the algorithm. Uh, so in particular, what we can quantify of the noise. So for instance, the effective temperature uh, or the, um, the average uh, um, final region that is spanned by different realization of the algorithm and relate this to the generalization properties of those particular regions to see whether noisier algorithm can lead you to better performing regions. But it's, uh, um, it's, it's complicated. And another, um, so I, I haven't tried the convolutional neural networks and I haven't tried to uh, measure, for instance, the effective temperature on uh, um, realistic uh, settings although this is something that can be done numerically. And, um, and for uh, uh, what concerns modeling, uh, I think that uh, um, one can build a toy model of convolutional networks um, where basically the network, instead of being fully connected, has just some uh, uh, shifting window of overlapping fields, but still, uh, uh, Still, what I see, com uh, it's complicated to really build a network that is also deep and studied it analytically. This is really multi-layer uh, analytic uh, studying of multi-layer uh, networks analytically is really one of the direction that uh, very active and very interesting because uh, for, for convolutional network to work, you need the uh, convolutional and pooling layers. So it doesn't make much sense to study models with, with just few layers. And the, that, that's definitely an interesting uh, future direction uh, of research. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you. Uh, let's see if people have other questions. Yes. Um, so if not, in fact, in the meanwhile, I still have another question. Um, so I wonder, do you have any like sort or insight to use, um, like you, you choose different type of the um, optimization, optimization functions, such as like gradient descent or the SGD you present here. Can that somehow give a guide to the choose of the hyperparameters of the, of the neural networks? So, I mean, in terms of the structures and also in terms of the, the batch size and um, the learning rates, I think you have shown that if you change that, it can change the performance. So do you think that for specific problem, uh, like the different type of the um, gradient method you use can be used or can help to design the hyperparameters for the training? Definitely. Uh, for the phase retrieval problem, uh, mm -hmm. it's maybe not even uh, needed in the sense that, uh, for instance, if you introduce uh, what's called the trimming, uh, which is a regularization strategy that basically uh, throws away all the labels that have a magnitude that is uh, higher than a certain threshold. Uh, then uh, you have that your landscape is much simpler. And I think that uh, in that case, almost all uh, like uh, training, uh, uh, like uh, learning rates and batch sizes will lead you to the minimum. But, uh, but the goal would be really to understand, like the goal would be to produce a phase diagram uh, where you have uh, uh, learning rates and batch sizes and the performance for different values of uh, different uh, types of networks. And um, we're, we are trying to do something in this flavor, but uh, it's, uh, it's very model dependent. So, so for sure, the optimal loss design uh, is, uh, is something that uh, one can study, and we are doing it a bit for phase retrieval. But, uh, but then to generalize, this is complicated because it's uh, for sure. Uh, uh, it's very model dependent yeah. of the, yeah. or the data dependent. So it's really the, 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 the goal is to extract something that is uh, general. And that's, uh, that's the complication. Yeah, but then you need some level of customization, no? Mm. Anyway, 
to make it useful. Yeah. But yeah, uh, to be honest, I'm really happy that uh, there is your group working in this direction. There are other people, but uh, from your presentation, I see there are very promising results. And uh, this is something that we all need in um, real applications, no? So trying to, to make it, to improve somehow in all the levels, the yeah, accuracy, the, the choice of the parameters. So will not be. <laughs> so yeah, your work is very welcome. <laughs> and uh, thank you to you and your group for pushing this forward. Um, yeah, so this was like, um, I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for this, uh, for this presentation. And uh, I think we, we have to close now, but uh, before leaving, uh, I want to um, just tell to everybody that we have a couple of um, call for papers. Um, so I will share uh, the screen. So thanks again, Francesca, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, Thank yeah, you I will just, time. yeah, great talk. Really enjoyed that. Um, I will just share a couple of um, call for papers before closing. Um, and uh, obviously this works also for you, Francesca, in case you are interested. Uh, so this year, we are running the fourth edition of the workshop on machine learning and data simulation for dynamical systems. The call for paper is both for machine learning and dynamical systems or dynamical systems for machine learning or data simulation for dynamical system, etc. So if you go on this link, I've copied the link in the chat box. Uh, you can see the call for papers. You can submit both um, conference papers, so that can be either seven pages or 14 pages. It will be published on a lecture notes in computer science or just an abstract to present your work within the community of um, uh, the International Conference of Computational Science, which is a top conference for computational science. So over the past years, we had very nice uh, uh, contributions, very interesting contributions. So hopefully uh, this year we will have the same. I'm sure about that. And the meeting will be, I didn't write that here, but the meeting will be uh, next June in uh, London. So you are all welcome to join us. We are, will be very happy to have you with us. And this is for the workshop. The deadline is the 21st of January for both abstracts or of conference papers. Then there is another one, uh, a call for journal papers on PCKA. Uh, and uh, we have a special issue named um, Machine Learning and Data Science for Dynamic Systems. So same, same kind of call, but this is for a journal paper, so longer contributions. And also in this case, you are very welcome uh, to submit your contribution. The idea could be also uh, submit like, for example, an abstract to the uh, conference and then a journal paper to the special issue in case you are interested and your work is mature enough to be submitted. So I will stop sharing now. And uh, I copied the link in the chat box. So in case you are interested, you're very welcome. So yeah, thank you again, Francesca. And um, Thibo, do you want to say anything to close the meeting? Yeah, so uh, thank you again, Francisca, for the very nice and inspiring talk this evening. And uh, thank you everyone for attending today's data learning talk. Um, have a nice evening and uh, yeah, hope see you to see you soon. Thank you. Bye thank everyone. You. Bye bye. Bye.